What's interesting about the latter day, you know, a procedure popularized and done very well in Europe. If you look at the outcomes, we looked and pulled all the radiographic outcomes for 49.5 years was barely rate, barely uh, AP x-ray follow-up. So we're learning a lot more about how this latter day truly behaves, but we do know that there is an acceptable amount of significant resorption of that bone. And you'll see some cases here uh, where it goes really in the wrong direction for whatever reason. This is, I think, an important concept. Not all bone loss is the same. I alluded to this with this attritional. Most of our patients, this was a, a military population, but it's the same thing I see in Vail. Most of these, if they have more than three to six months of instability, have this uh, resorption. So a significant amount of the bone resorbs and it's a, it's a problem. And this attritional bone loss, uh, we really need, you know, just be careful about saying I can go in and repair that bony fragment because first of all, it's, it's more than six weeks old, it's gonna be soft. I've been there, ask me how I know. It's, it's, not, a good, it's not a good situation. We think you're gonna fix it with screws. Uh, you gotta get after a glenoid bone fracture early if you think you're gonna fix it with screws. Um, <clears throat> I asked a question back in about 2006 because I had a lot of, I had glen fresh glenoids on order. Why can't we reconstruct this anatomically? I wanted to reconstruct it, but it was really hard to get a, uh, a fresh glenoid uh, because mostly of donor concerns. Uh, on average, our graft companies, which are nonprofit mandated by the FDA, on average, each uh, donated body for life, uh, you know, that donates their uh, body for tissue, 174 lots, in other words, barcodes, of grafts come from every donated cadaver. It's, it's, it's not just tendons, it's, not, it's, it's a lot. It's skin, it's 20 cc's of bone chips, 10 cc's of bone chips, 174. If you have a level three contamination, and they get those if they go more central to the body, clostridium, higher level bacteria, they can use zero, zero out of 174. So some of this is a decision about the respect of their life and the donor concerns. So I asked them, well, what don't you use? It's hard to get something central. They didn't like doing a four quarter amputation, increase contamination risk, increase the level three risk. So it's hard to get humeral heads. It's hard to get uh, fresh glenoids. And I said, well, we throw away all these distal tibias. Our foot and ankle surgeons use the talus, but they don't do anything with these tibias. So anyway, we did a lot of work on that and we found that it fits well up to 30 millimeters top to bottom. It doesn't fit well if it's huge, but you can get a lot of the glenoid with 30 millimeters. We then also have done a lot of work looking now at uh, male to male, female to female, and basically that's all I order is a, is a male to a male, female to a female graft, because uh, there's very little uh, differences. We've also found that the concavity of it is matched. There's actually a law in uh, nature that talks about a conserved radius of curvature uh, throughout the human body. There's some kind of law, I don't know what it is, but it has some kind of radius of curvature conservation law, whether you're looking at the thumb joint or the shoulder joint or the ankle joint, uh, uh, that how we were developed as humans, uh, these radius of curvatures are pretty well matched up to certain certain sizes. So when do I do it? Large bone loss, may 20, maybe 25%. I'm starting to get a little less, especially now with some arthroscopic techniques. Certainly a failed ladder J, uh, scope bank heart, you know, bipolar issues, et cetera. And so here's our approach. Uh, sometimes hardware removal, subscap split, um, and uh, glenoid exposure. Uh, so here's a failed big uh, bone loss type of case, uh, like an arthroscopic rasp or the power rasp. Actually, I'll open up a power rasp and put it on the shaver as long as you keep that shaft cool. It works really well. Um, this has been uh, very helpful to help prep the graphs. We kind of made this, so it was about 23 millimeters top to bottom, but you can actually make it bigger and it comes in a lot of different uh, angles and options. It's got graph size that you can stick in the shoulder and uh, be able to put the uh, graft in. It's a fresh uh, distal tibia and uh, this really allows for a precise cutting. Uh, I would love what Kevin did with the 3D models. I have a 3D printer in my office. We 3D print a lot of these, uh, do reverse molds, uh, do all kinds of things and, and love that. Uh, it's been a nice nice addition to the, uh, to the CT scan to actually put your hands on it ahead of time. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, just simple steps to this. Uh, so it's about, there's three cutting jigs and then the last one is the final uh, 
jig where you take it out, but you're actually already drilling, pre-drilling the 4 uh, drill holes to accommodate your screws. And this is where you set your length. And so the two outer slots are right around 23 millimeters, but you can slide it and get a little bigger bone, gra bone graft. And there's uh, probably a 10 or a 15 degree graft by about 10 millimeters anterior to posterior. And base that all uh, based on a, a preoperative uh, CT scan and evaluation. And they were able to fix it uh, pretty standard fashion. So here's a pretty large one top to bottom. Uh, I've gone down in a little bit in size uh, over the last uh, 12 years of doing this. And uh, you can see that the concavity is very well, very well maintained. So now we've, I, I actually stopped for about a year and a half, two years to collect our outcomes. I wanted to make sure we were doing, you know, something reasonable. We weren't getting graft lysis. And what was amazing, we were getting only about three, four, five percent graft lysis at now three years, not the 57% of the coracoid. And I think, again, some of that has to do with probably traction of the conjoint tendon, uh, seeing very good scores. Uh, and then the other thing we have to be careful of is how we talk about lysis. I want, I, what I want is healing rate. I want healing rate of the native glenoid to whatever bone graft you're using. Ilia crest, tibia, uh, ladder J. The interface is very important. And so we had a uh, more than 90% interface healing if you looked at it top to bottom and medial to lateral. So it was a really good interface uh, healing rate. But you get these that do happen from ladder J. Uh, here's all ladder J's, either my cases or cases sent to me, hardware failure wear and tear, uh, et cetera. And so these are the, uh, these are the cases we think about to uh, revise uh, with a DTA uh, for fixation, uh, especially, the, especially the failed ladder J. So here's a good example, last one of a failed ladder J. You can see that that bone is pulled off, it's resorbed. Uh, occasionally you need to think about infection and we're doing, I sometimes do a stage sc a scope approach, do some uh, scope biopsies for one quick case. Uh, and then uh, come back two weeks later once we've ruled out uh, P. acnes. You have to be careful because this is what you have. And something very medial, I grabbed my fellow's hand the other day as we were doing a failed ladder day to a distal tibia case. He was almost, almost about ready to cut something bad there. And I was like, it's right, it's right there. And uh, I think it was a good, good moment for this uh, individual to realize how, how much uh, is there. There's a lot of high priced real estate. And we'll play, we'll play with this in the lab. I'm going to show you this. These are um, suture washers. It's a nice way to, the suture's actually integrated here into the washer. You actually tension slide it down and bring that capsule down just like this. So uh, I use this and sometimes a combination of uh, fiber tacks, top and bottom, or a tie it into the CA ligament. There's a lot of different ways to uh, do this. Uh, we now looked at DTA and our Ladder J outcomes. I had about uh, 50 patients each. We really had no difference between DTA and Ladder J. The DTA group was also presented with more failures uh, preoperatively, so we didn't see any uh, big issues with that. And then uh, how do you deal with uh, complications? Uh, with the Latter-J revision outcomes, we just finished this. Their Latter-J revision uh, outcomes, so a failed Latter-J, there's only been case reports in the literature. Uh, we just published on this, 31 patients all treated with a distal tibia. These are the typical cases. Uh, most of these had resorb, 80% uh, resorption, and these are the type of uh, outcomes we were getting. They weren't perfect, but we, especially the WOSI was about 310, and some of these patients have been through a lot of shoulder procedures, but you know, certainly, certainly improved uh, pretty significantly and were much more, much more stable. But again, these are almost salvage type of procedures, but it does give you a good option to be able to put that in place. And so here's our pre and post outcome scores. We had uh, actually some professional athletes uh, and from Major League Baseball, NBA, even, even football at this point for some failed uh, rehab. I do about uh, four to six weeks uh, in a sling and then full activities right around five to six months.